me begin now, and I'll begin by introducing my dear friend, Jim Bertrand. It's been a little minute. I've had him on multiple times. It's been a minute, but I'm glad to have him back on. I know you've been doing the rounds touring lately. Brother, how have you been, my friend? You are the man when it comes to the information, the shroud. How have you been, my friend? Well, thank you for your kind words there, William. I'm, I'm like everyone else, uh, uh, trying to do my best to have a, a, a meaningful Lent. And at the same time, then traveling around, giving shroud talks. I was in Florida recently in Texas before that. Got several yeah. states coming up here. So people are hungry for the message of the shroud, and it's, it's a privilege to share it with them. Yeah, no, they definitely are. And I, I wish I would have been able to make it out there. I know you were, I believe, in Austin, not too far away from me. A little ways, but not too far. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, my schedule is jam-packed. I wasn't able to make it out there. Uh, hopefully, you make your way down to Texas again, though. Uh, I hope you've had great crowds. Um, I'm and coming to Austin in April. Oh, you're coming back in April. You're coming back. Yeah, April 20th to 27th. Yeah, that's a that's more of a, a leisure trip. Oh, gotcha. But I'll be okay. in that area. I'd love to see if we can make make that work. So we'll go. We will. There. We will without a doubt make it work. I've got family over there. We visit very often over there. Yeah. So without a doubt, we will make that work, brother. I, that's very exciting. Now, you know, before we dive in, let me ask you: um, when it comes to the shroud. Has there been anything new that has come up that you might say, you know what, William, there's been something new and I'm, you know, I want to talk about that. Or has it been pretty much the same, which isn't always a bad thing, because I thought that your past presentations have been incredible. Uh, is there anything new on the horizon when it comes to the Shroud? I would say the new thing is I'm hearing more and more about uh, spiritual conversion miracles. Wow. More so, more so than I saw 10 years ago or five years ago. I, I'm seeing it in both you know, people talking to me, but also when I view other uh, YouTube videos and other interviews and people talk in the chat box, people talk in the comments yeah. and seeing more of this. So I, I believe the Shroud is having a very positive impact that way. Oh man! And I believe oh. your viewers today, they're, they're going to see and hear some new things perhaps they didn't know. Uh, yeah. We'll take a look at those uh, as well as some basic Shroud facts and some open questions. All right. Fantastic. And questions, go ahead, William. Yeah, no, fantastic. I said, yeah, great. One of the questions I often get asked is, have there been any miracles associated with the shroud? And in a way, yes, because the, the, miracle, the shroud is a message of hope for the miracle of our own resurrection. I, I'd like to share a true story of the shroud that conveys this. And very few people have heard of this. But for those that have heard of it, I want to clarify exactly what happened, because sometimes the facts weren't conveyed in retelling the story. And I'd like to give people the facts of this. Uh, yeah. I was able to obtain the very first recounting of the story from last century by an author named Charles Foley, and it concerns a girl named Josephine Woolham. And wow. if we can go to the uh, to the uh, slides now, a yeah. little Josie, there she is. Wow. Yes. Well, he got this from speaking to her mother. So this comes from the horse's mouth, so to speak, all right? All right. Now, there was a small girl. By the way, his story went about 10 pages, and I've got it condensed into about four paragraphs here for the sake of brevity here. But there was a small girl... And she was born in England in 1945. Her name is Josephine Woolham. Uh, when she was five, she developed osteomyelitis, which is a, an acute inflammation of bone marrow. And it sped, spread throughout her whole body. And by the time she was 10, her left leg was eight inches shorter than her right. And she was physically worn down, mentally weighed 42 pounds, had a host of health problems. And she was hospitalized in serious condition. She was given the last rites in 1955 at age 10. Now, about this time, her father brought home a magazine that featured an article by a, a Royal Air Force officer, Captain Leonard Cheshire, the UK, in which he wrote about the shroud. And someone from his office sent the mother a picture of the holy face, right? I can see this holy face here. And yeah. the mother put this on her mantle at home and she prayed in front of this and within that hour the hospital called and they said uh your daughter's conditions changed you better get up here and so she rushes off to the hospital you know thinking the worst when yeah. she gets there josie was up and wheeling about in her wheelchair the doctor said she was completely healed from her osteomyelitis wow. and he further stated uh, this cannot be explained scientifically so this was a healing from praying to the holy face picture, but not oh. by touching the shroud, okay? But there's more to the story now. Uh, Josie's mother sent a request from her daughter requesting Captain Cheshire uh, to help Josie uh, have obtain a relic of the Holy Shroud. You know, who does that, right? Wow. 
that after much effort, he did arrange to have the shroud brought out for her. And they made the trip to Turin. And we can advance that here again. Mm -hmm. There we go. There is Captain Cheshire in the Turin Cathedral pushing her in her wheelchair. Wow. Right? And they laid the shroud across her lap and nothing happened. And upon returning, she noticed a change from her outlook on life. Uh, when her mother met her on a return from Turin, she asked her what she received in Turin. And Josie replied, more than I went to ask for, unquote. And she later had that left leg amputated when she was 21, but she got a job as a telephone operator. And in 1968, she met Ray Jones and they got married. And their, their first child unfortunately died before age one in 1970, but they had a second child, a healthy boy in 1973. And in an interview, Josie stated, something changed for me in Turin. Something was given to me that day, a grace to face the daily troubles of living. I'm happy and content. And that has stayed with me every day ever since. And she died from a lung ailment on May 31st, 1981. And so if people talk about, have there been any physical miracles with the shroud? Sometimes this is referred to, but it was really more of a spiritual miracle, you know, in the presence of the yeah. shroud, her physical healing took place while she was in a hospital bed and her mother prayed before the holy face. Wow, that truly is incredible. I'd never ever heard of that before, but now that you, you, you recount that particular story, you tell us that story, that truly is amazing. So there is evidence of that, solid evidence of that, and that, that truly, you know, that really does bring to mind that devotions to holy items, to holy relics, to holy uh, images are truly within the Catholic faith. They, they're amazing. And this, of course, is a biblical concept and an ancient concept as well. Uh, that's an incredible story, brother. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. You know, and even more importantly, that the Holy Face inspires, uh, it inspires spiritual conversions, you know, of the heart wow. and, and from godlessness to, to, to Christianity and that type of thing. So I, 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 I share those types of things with people. And I, I had a little, you know, in Josie's story, she said, God gave me more than I asked for. Mm -hmm. And he gives, he does the same for us, depending on what we ask for. He doesn't always give us what we ask for. But he usually gives us something better. And I think yeah. a relevant way of saying this is, you know, God provides. And I can recount one incident from my own life. Oh, this was about 22, 23 years ago. Uh, our parish was celebrating the 10th anniversary of beginning perpetual adoration at our parish. We started in 1992 and in March of 2002, after mass one Sunday, we were gonna have donuts to, to celebrate, you know, the 10th anniversary of adoration. Yeah. And uh, Father, Father asked me to go ahead and get, you know, 15 dozen donuts. Uh, back then it was less than $5 a dozen. It was $66 and 10 cents, I recall, getting these donuts, oh. you know, 15 dozen. So what's 15 squared is 225, a bunch of donuts, yeah. right? Oh yeah. And I, should I guess should I guess go to the office to get reimbursed next week? He goes, no, no, just put out the free will basket and you'll be okay. And I was thinking at the time, boy, I hope wow. I don't lose on this. <laughs> Back then, that's what I was, that was my thinking. Well, after the three masses got over, I got the free will offering basket and I counted out the money. And wouldn't you know it, it was exactly $66.10 to the penny. Wow. So I thought, okay, God, you I, I get the message. I need not worry. And so I haven't worried about money since that time. It, it doesn't mean that we oh. won't have, you know, $500 car bills and no doubt when things come up. We don't need to worry about that. Right. But you trust that the Lord and will provide in some way and the Lord will protect those that truly have faith in him. That's a great message, brother. Sure. Sure. Well, let's continue here. I, yeah. I want to go just a few primer things on the shroud. I know a lot sure. of your, your viewing audience know some things about the shroud, mm -hmm. but this would be very, very brief, just less than five slides here, okay? Sure. Maybe, all right. And that's what we're talking about. This is a pure linen, and linen and cotton are two different things. This is pure linen, and it bears the image of what we believe to be Christ in his burial shroud. You see the front image there, and there's the back side. It's a 14 feet, three inches by uh, three feet, seven inches, which is exactly eight cubits by, by two cubits used at the time of Christ, uh, the Syrian cubit at 21.7 inches. And in case people are still having trouble seeing it, I'm gonna take just the left side here and we're gonna rotate it 90 degrees here, okay? Mm -hmm. So now you can see the upright posture, the face there, those brown lines are the scorch marks from a fire in 1532. 
and those triangles are the patches that went over it uh, from that, right? And th this image includes, you know, the frontal and dorsal side, of course. And, you know, forensics tells us that this man on the shroud was about five feet, 10 inches tall, and he weighed about 170 pounds. And if you look toward the right, if you look on those four triangles on the right, those patches, the second patch from the right, there's a blood stain, we believe, from the landscape oh, yeah. side there. Perhaps you can see that. Wow. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, now let's compare the shroud to some other artwork, all right, over the centuries here. Uh, actually, that, that'll be the next slide about the artwork, but this one I want to show a couple things that make the shroud, you know, very unique. Uh, what you see on the left, that very faint image, that is the cloth image of the shroud, and there's actually a mirror image of the shroud, so that blood stain that looks like a backwards three or a Greek epsilon, that that would have been shaped like a, the letter, the number three in the middle. The middle picture is the photographic negative. And when you, when you look at yourself into a mirror, things are reversed. Well, what we see on the shroud is reversed, but the photographic negative orients it the way it would have been. So that blood stain you know, would have been uh, the shape of a three. Uh, that little circle at the top is not the top of the head. That, that is a water stain, okay? okay? Right Now, what's unique about this third picture is that it was taken using a very unique instrument called the BP-8 image analyzer developed by NASA because it measures light intensities that were used in the Apollo program to uh, map the surface of the moon, all right? But, but pictures don't contain light intensity information, they're colors and shapes. But the analyzer shows these raised features because it shows there's a direct correlation between the cloth to body distance at the moment of image formation. So in other words, that green picture on your right there where the nose is raised, that yeah. shows us that the nose was in closer contact with the linen, as were the cheeks and chin, and the eyes are further back. They're not as raised, all right? And there's no side images, but this is true for the entire body. Uh, no other photo on earth can produce that 3D effect. And, and that is what inspired Dr. John Jackson to uh, set up the STIRP study of the shroud uh, in 1978 when he first saw this picture in 1976. Okay. Wow. Uh, regarding a little history here, and this is the last slide, and just one more slide on this. You know, one of the oldest icons people might recognize is on the left there called the Pentacleter, Christ ruler of all. And it mm -hmm. dates to the early sixth century. It was very well preserved in the desert sands. Uh, it was discovered at St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, where there's been a Catholic uh, monastery there since the sixth century when this picture shows up. We discovered the 20th century. But when we compare that picture to the shroud, uh, shroud researcher Alan Wanger found more than 150 points of congruence between the two. The only difference is that those eyes are open and on the shroud, the eyes are closed. And, and in a court of law, 50 points of congruence are enough to prove that two images are of the same person and that the shroud has 150. So the point wow. there on the left is that we don't know who made that painting, but they had to have been looking at the shroud to get all those, those details. Yeah. And when we look over in the coin on the right, this is sometimes called the Justinian the second coin, the Tremesis coin of 692 AD. And for some reason, it didn't slide over there. The 692 should be over there on the right under the word coin, all yeah. right? And what, this was uh, analyzed now by Professor Giulio Fonti of the University of Padua in Italy. And he's compared this coin to the shroud face, and he measured 12 different significant features. For example, the ratio between the eyes and the nose is exactly 1.00 to 1.26. Now, many other coins were made like this across Europe, but this is the only one that matches the shroud, and it was only produced in one place. Wow. Constantinople in 692, yeah. 692 AD. So... We believe that that feature, and by there's 11 other features that I don't have time to go into, but mathematically to get all of these features right, the asymmetric face, the beard, the hair and everything uh, is, is a pretty high number in terms of what would be the odds of just guessing it right. And in his research, he concluded with greater than 99.99% certainty that whoever minted that coin had to have used the, the face on the shroud as a model. And this was wow. in his book called The First Century of Christ, The Shroud of Turin. So these, these two historical facts give compelling evidence of the Shroud's presence in these early centuries, well before the 10th century. Right? Yeah, and these, these are quite early as well. That's incredible information. So, the, right. so let me just double check with you. That coin 
that coin is from the late seventh century. That that truly is amazing. Yes, and and the details on it uh, seem to match really well. Yeah, with the shroud. You know, after all these years, so they had to have been even better at the time it was made, probably. Yeah, no doubt, and it seems to match um, very very well. I'm looking at it, and I'm just I'm I'm blown away. It really does. Yeah. You know, I, I I'm convinced it really does match up very well. Yeah. And there's two features in that coin on his right hand is raised in blessing. That's the mercy of God. And his left hand is holding a book that the Bible, that is the justice of God. So the mercy and justice of God, those two attributes of God are displayed with this, with this photograph that speaks all languages really. Yeah. Wow. And you know, that, that concludes what I was going to say about the, the shroud in terms of some, some basics there. Um, I think after seeing much more comprehensive presentations on the Holy Shroud, each person can come to their own, you know, well-reasoned judgment regarding the question of authenticity. There's more to it than that. Yeah. And while, while science, you know, can't prove the resurrection, it has proven that the image on the shroud is not a natural process and nor is it the work of an artist. And, you know, so, so what's yeah. left? And if the shroud is authentic, then, then what should our response be? Should we be indifferent or can we use it to strengthen our faith? So that's the question I pose to people. Uh, I've got over a hundred other slides, William, that I could go through, but we're not gonna try to win a debate here. Right. Uh, we're just gonna share, share those basic facts and let the facts speak for themselves. Uh, matter of fact, I think the, the scientific information on the shroud has been extensively shared across the world on the internet. There are literally hundreds of books these days focusing on the science of the shroud. But, but what is, I think, more needed is a summary. I don't think anyone has done this in a comprehensive way. Right. A summary of the spiritual miracles of the Shroud. And I'd, I'd like to just share a couple of those here with you. Definitely. Okay. This was a book written by a Jewish man, right? And he had had an experience with the Shroud where he was, he had been a very Orthodox Jew, but he had read uh, the Gospel of John and he believed this could be the Messiah, but he wasn't quite sure. And it was while looking at this image of a shroud face that he received an, an, an infusion of graces to understand how, how Jesus Christ could be the second person of the Blessed Trinity, could be God with a human nature and a divine nature. It's a very difficult concept uh, for a Jew to think that, the, that God could be a Trinity. And even among Catholic, cradle Catholics, we can't explain the Trinity either, but that singular grace uh, converted him and he uh, took our RCA class and became a Catholic. He got wow. permission. To, he wrote this book. He got permission from his bishop to go around the diocese and speak about it. And that is just one small story, okay? There are, are many others that go along with this, just a handful here, our list. Uh, Charbel Raish, he lived in a, a Muslim culture in Australia as a teenager and would have likely become Muslim. However, he had an experience looking at an image of the shroud that converted him as well in front of the tabernacle. He now runs a ministry down in Australia. I think he's in his thirties or forties. I think I've heard of him. Yeah, I've heard of him. He's, he's got a ministry. Is it called Perugia? Yeah, yeah, that is him. I've heard of him, yeah. You know, he's got a wonderful story, but maybe you could have wow. him on your show to, to give more. I have more. to, yeah. He could do it more justice than I could because he experienced that personally. Wow. Uh, next there, Tristan Casabianca was an agnostic atheist actually. and and. He became converted by the Shroud and he became a very active player in, in the Shroud world. He's known around the world today. And you'll get to that a little bit later here. Mark Antonacci from St. Louis decades ago was intrigued by the Shroud. And he can he he attributes his his uh, conversion to Christianity from the Shroud. Uh, the next name there, Father Joseph Mary Wolf, was always Catholic. However, he explains how the Shroud deepened his faith. And he's a commentator on EWTN TV. Wow. And then. The next two gals there, Susan Tasson and Julie Stanton, are just a couple of other stories of, of people that have had conversion experiences with the Shroud. So a point here is it's not the physical miracles that we're seeing with the Shroud, but but the spiritual ones, the conversions. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That, that truly is incredible. I got a couple other ones here for you. It's awful small reading from my screen. You want to read that one for them, the one by Leon? It's non- yeah, definitely. When I was in a coma, my heart stopped three times. I went into cardiac arrest three times. I called the name of Yeshua, Ha Me Me Mehia Ben Yosef, and I vividly remember seeing this face. Wow. Yeah. 
And I don't know the rest of the story on that one, but these are the kinds of things that are coming up if you if you watch enough of these enough of these these presentations on the shroud. And the next one that I can see myself there it said, yeah, I was an atheist obsessed with science for many years, but science and non-biblical evidence led me to believe with all my mind, heart, and soul, it's obvious Jesus is who he said he was. Yeah. All right. And so those are just uh, there are many more. I, I'm not even touching the iceberg on these here. Uh, but moving right along here, uh, that face has has been a very powerful witness for, for many people oh, yeah. thinking about their conversions there. No doubt. I want to go to uh, the open questions now. Uh, if we can get to that slide here. I'm going to mm -hmm. my window come. There it is. So you got it for me already. Yeah, yeah, I got it. I got it right there. <laughs> what a guy. You are so good at this. Okay. <laughs> well, I follow along. I'm really, I really, really get into it. Okay. Well, these are the questions that sometimes are given in presentations as factual, but there are actually maybe two or three or four options on these. And so okay. I call these op uh, open questions, things we aren't definitively certain about, but I think mm -hmm. they need to be clarified because many times uh, these things get repeated as facts, whereas in, in truth, there might be three or four options, all right? Uh, so we begin here with the history of the shroud, all right? And <clears throat> how did it get from Jerusalem to Turin? Or how did it get from mainly beginning from Jerusalem to Constantinople? We know it spent some centuries in Constantinople. The red line there follows the research of Dr. Jack Markwart. And he wrote a 76 page paper in this about 10 years ago. And it's also in his more recent book on the history of the shroud. And he states that St. Jerome relates a holding a document in his hand called the Lost Gospel of the Hebrews that describes yeah. the servant of the high priest bringing the burial linens of Christ to Antioch. And from there, the tradition goes that the, the, the Persians attacked Antioch in about 540, and Bishop Ephraimius is said to have taken the shroud on horseback to central Turkey at Kamaliana for, horse, for safekeeping before the Persians destroyed Pan Antioch. Well, he died before... Uh, coming back to get it. And then later in 574, it's believed the, the emperor from the royal palace in Constantinople had the shroud brought there, the image not made by human hands in 574. Well, that is one version, but there's another version that people are probably more familiar with. And that's on the right there, that purple arrow you see there yeah. going Odessa to Constantinople. And that is the research of Dr. Ian Wilson Ian Wilson has, has been a shroud. Uh, I don't know if he's a doctor or not. Sometimes people, we we, we give these experts names doctor. You know, I'm not a doctor. Right. People, <laughs> right. I, I, I made that mistake as well. Yeah. <laughs> Ian Wilson from, from Great Britain had uh, came out with this decades ago that the, the route of the shroud went from Jerusalem to Odessa, and then it arrived in Constantinople in 944. And so which of those two is, is the actual route or was it something else we can't say with certainty? But that's one of the open questions is what was the route from Jerusalem to Constantinople? Okay. All right. And then we go to the, the next one here. Now, let me, what, let, me, let me pause just for one moment sure. just to clarify because I know my audience will be fascinated by this because I've got a lot of people that are just like me. They're nerds when it comes to the early church fathers. Could you briefly <laughs> mention St. Jerome there. Now, I know you've talked about that before, and it really, I, I don't remember the text off the top of my head, but I remember that it really did seem compelling to me what you had mentioned there. Now, is there any evidence that St. Jerome would have perhaps been aware of this shroud? What are your, what are your opinions on that? Do you have a, a solid opinion on that, or do you think it's a little, a little too ambiguous? What do you think? Sure. Well, I, I can give my opinion, and that is during those early centuries, it was probably well hidden, particularly the first three or four centuries, because of all the martyrdoms that were going on, all right? Yeah. So Saint, it's likely St. Jerome did not see the shroud, but people have uh, had proposed that in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul addresses the Ephesians and he says, oh, you foolish Galatians, or excuse me, not the Ephesians, the Galatians. Yeah, Galatians 3, chapter 1, you foolish Galatians, what has bewitched you? For you saw for yourself an image of the crucified Lord. And hmm, might that have been the shroud? I don't know, but that would have been first century, obviously, with Paul. Right. But it probably went into hiding after that. And so we didn't see it uh, perhaps until centuries later. And there's a couple of theories on that, that it was hit above the Cherubim Gate in, uh, in Antioch or the Cherubim Gate above Edessa. Both cities claim that. And this is not unique. Uh, a century ago, there were two cities to claim to have the location where John the Baptist did the baptizing of Jesus. 
right they compete for that and so this is one of those things and i can't tell you which one is the right one uh but you know it is what it is that way so um, my guess is that in these early centuries that the shroud was hidden and most likely most christians did did not get to see it until you know after it came out of hiding from and by the way, where, where was it at? This cherubim gate, there was a flood and an earthquake in 525 that killed some 30,000 people. We don't know exactly how many, but it's been estimated wow. to be that. And, if, and when they were repairing the city gates, that's when it was discovered. And both both cities claim that they had, had found it in an earthen jar. And there's actually some water stains on the shroud that match up with a unique folding pattern. And wow. I tested that and it does work, but I won't get into too much details on that. But I hope that answers your question about those early centuries. No, it really does. And I think it does make a whole lot of sense, considering that for many centuries in the early church, there was intense persecution. You know, they were worried about being killed. They were being killed and martyred every day. They did their very best to preserve the texts that they could, and they would have preserved relics as well. They would have definitely hidden them so they would not have been destroyed. So that it really does, does fit in with everything that we know of the time period. That's a great, great way you brought that out, yeah. brother. Great way you laid it out. Well, thank you for reinforcing that. It makes perfect sense that we don't hear much written about the shroud. Otherwise, it would have been destroyed. Yeah. Yeah, I, be I believe so. I think that that uh, very clearly, if anything that was if anything was precious to the early Christians and they were being heavily persecuted because they were hated, uh, well, without a doubt, they're going to look for those relics that they loved so greatly and they would have uh, desired to destroy them. So it does mm -hmm. make a lot of sense to me. It really does. Sure. Well, should we move on to the missing years then? Yeah, yeah no doubt. And we, we know the Shroud is in Constantinople for two reasons. In 1201, they took a, a uh, inventory. Nicholas Meserides uh, recalls seeing the Shroud in that inventory. And in 1204, we had the eyewitness of Robert de Clary, a knight, seeing it being venerated. And there's a bunch of things that go with that, but I'll, I'll keep moving here. But then it disappears after the Fourth Crusade, uh, which is another story in itself. They have the sack of Constantinople. But it, it appears again in 1355 in Lyrae, France. Now, some books and some references will say 1354. We don't need to split hairs. If it was 1354, I can go with that. But most of my references talk about 1355. And, and uh, Geoffrey de Charnay is the one that displays it. And they asked him, you know, where did you get this? And his response is, it was freely given. And that's kind of where the trail ends. So there's an intense interest in this 150-year period here. And there are three possibilities, all right, on this one as well. This is another one of those open questions. One possibility, I'll, and I'll put them in, in order from um, mm -hmm. lowest to highest probability, all right? The, the one you sometimes hear about is the Knights Templar going through yeah. France. There is some circumstantial evidence of, of knights and relics and things, but nothing really that solid. Uh, a second uh, hypothesis is that it came through Joffrey de Charnay's wife, who's Jean de Vergy, whose great great grandfather, uh, Othon de la Roche, was present in Constantinople in 1204. Uh, that has been proposed. And a third one is through Joffrey de Charnay's family line himself. And it traces back through his mother, his great uncle, and all the way back through uh, St. Louis the Ninth, whose cousin was Baldwin II, who was the emperor of Constantinople at the time of the sack. So there's a there's a link from the emperor who possessed the shroud right up to Geoffrey, Geoffrey de Charnay. All three of those are uh, possibilities. That So that's another open question of where it was during the missing years. And I would say, uh, William, that in international shroud conferences, those are the probably the two, the two main topics that papers should give on is where was it at during the missing years and how was the image formed? Yeah. Those are the two big questions that are gaining a lot of research. Well, should we move on? Yeah, no okay. doubt. Great, great information, brother. I think thus far, um, <laughs> yeah, everything is very, very clear. I'm blown away by everything. And I think uh, that thus far, the evidence is, is, is very powerful. And, and I'm, I'm enjoying the fresh approach to this because, as you point out, very often when you watch Shroud shows or Shroud events, if you will, uh, they will tackle it from a different perspective rather than hearing the spiritual aspects of it as well. That is something that was completely new to me. And I think that fantastic for the Lenten season that we're going through. Uh, great, great job thus far, brother. I'm really enjoying this. Well, thank you for saying that, though. I and mean, will be God. I, I think Amen. because we're made of a body and a soul, uh, we can we can nurture both if we unite truth with the human heart. And so yeah. both those aspects, I think, are very important to uh, 
Definitely. Well, we go to the carbon dating. People ask the question about, you know, the carbon oh, yeah. dating. What was up with that? Well, in 1988, of course, the sample was taken from down there by the right foot. That's the right picture. And I've enlarged it. So on the left side, you see that corner down there on the left. And, and that entire area could fit inside a three by five card quite easily. Each of those samples is about the size of your thumbnail, about the size of a postage stamp. And in uh, early 1989, they, uh, the people that had done the carbon dating at Oxford, they got the data, they, they got the data from uh, Tucson, Arizona, and Zurich, Switzerland. Now it was supposed to go, it was supposed to go to Turin, Italy, University of Padua, but it did not. That was one of the 15 protocol violations. They took the data and never displayed it. They wrote a paper saying that the shroud came from the year 1325 to plus or minus 65 years. And so over the years, there were questions about that because the raw data was never given. What, what did the machine say? What were the numbers, all right? But in, in 2017, Tristan Casabianca, who I've just mentioned from France, he sued Oxford by invoking the freedom of information law. And Oxford released the data from the three labs for the first time. There were 700 pages of it. Now, he teamed up with an eminent shroud scholar named Professor Emanuela Marinelli of Italy. She's very highly esteemed, uh, a shroud scholar of world-class uh, qualifications there. Those two got together with some statisticians, and when they started looking at the raw data, they found that the probabilities that were claimed in the article for Nature magazine in 1989 were false. Right? Wow. Because it gets younger as you move. See that red line? Yeah, I see that. Every inch, it gets 91 to 97 years younger. Mm -hmm. And that is just an impossibility. You can imagine a thread that one end of the thread is 400 years younger than the other end. That just that can't be representative of the entire uh, of the entire cloth. Well, and it gets even more deep than that. This next slide, next four slides I'm going to share with you here. OK, uh, I'm going to I need to uh, give uh, credit. I'm indebted to the editor of the British Society for the Turin Shroud, uh, Michael Kowalski, who has graciously given me permission to share these next four slides with you. And, and don't be intimidated by the math. It'll just take us a minute or two. But as long as you understand the fourth slide, that's the point to be made here. OK, so here we go. Uh, across the bottom, Oxford is showing those in those blue triangles to be about 700 to 800 years old. And Zurich shows it a little bit older. And the Arizona sample shows it to be a little bit uh, older than that. Now, you're seeing like 12 samples up there that they were given four and they were cut into smaller pieces. All right. So this is what they were claiming in their measurements, that this was the distribution. All right. And so from that, they published this table here of the data. And here's the data table that was published. Right. Not this exact looking one, but the data was there where it says control one and two. They had some samples that were about a thousand years old, uh, two thousand years old, and they calibrate their machines, and then they they're supposed to uh, put in the shroud sample as a blind sample. But it was not a blind sample. Everybody knew what it was. It was the only sample that had a three-in-one herringbone weave, because it was so rare they couldn't get those. So everyone knew when they put that sample in what it was. Now these numbers they're showing, don't get too confused about those. It's the bottom ones that count. Can you see it near the bottom where it says x squared value? Oh, yeah. OK, that's yep. called pi square value. And there's going to be some deviations. All right. For example, if you flip a coin 100 times, could you get 52 heads and 48 tails? Sure. That, that's a, an acceptable right. deviation. You run it through the But if you had 91 and nine, hmm, that's not going to happen in your life. And you spend your whole lifetime. You won't get those kinds of numbers. You have to get right. nine out of 10, 10 times in a row. All right. So the chi-square kind of gives us an idea of uh, it varies, but what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Now, the chi-square value there is shown to be 6.4. And the, the probability of that then is 5%, where it says probability of the percentage there, 5%. Yeah. These other ones had very low chi-square values. Can you see a 0.1? Wow, that's 90% within the range there. Amazing. Here's a one. Wow. Yeah. So the, the, the lower your chi-square value, the more acceptable it is. Does that make sense? Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's totally That's sense. all people need to know. And 5% is the very bottom acceptable level. A 5% is 1 out of 20. If something has a 1 out of 20 chance, that is considered acceptable deviation. But anything wow. lower than that, 4.99, that is considered significant deviation. So this is where we draw the line. Now, this is what they showed. But here, you're going to see some problems with that. For instance, they had 64, 646 
plus or minus 31 years. No, mm -hmm. down here, it was like 17, wasn't it? Yeah. So the range is off. There's an error there. And it's not only with the Arizona sample, but in the next slide, we're going to see the Oxford slam sample is also an error. Oh, wow. And the weighted mean, which is supposed to be, what, 689 plus or minus 18, was really 672 plus or minus 13. <laughs> wow. Now that changes the chi-square value from 6.4 to 8.5. Boy, it shot up, didn't it? What are the chances of that? It's not 5%. It's 1.4%. Yeah. So this, is, this is called significant deviation. All right. And this is not a rare thing. It happens 20% of the time that you get significant deviation and results have to be thrown out. But this was the these were the errors that were not shared in 1980 nine that we know now and yeah. they published this in a peer, scientific peer-reviewed journal in 2019 and here we are five years later there has not been a single challenge to what i just showed you on the screen there this is factual data it's mathematically sound and you know two plus three is five and you just can't argue with it so yeah. my, my point here is that the, the the carbon dating of 1988 in light of this new information is, is invalid by the chi-square test and so it's it's not an issue anymore. That that is <clears> that's, that's amazing. Was, let me let me let me just double check with you. Let me just double check that that this has not been challenged, right? As you said, right. Wow, I heard amazing. that uh, last month from a talk given by Professor Emanuele Marinelli online. Yeah, she said no one has challenged us. Wow, yeah, that really does point to how how accurate it is. If it has not been challenged, that's great information, there, brother. Yeah, and it's it's too bad that this is not being shared with the public because yeah. it didn't generate sensationalistic headlines, you know? Yeah, too few, too few people know this. In fact, <clears throat> a lot of the people that I encounter and dialogue with, even believers, a lot of the times have it in their mind, well, you know what, uh, the, the published test reports and all the information out there in regards to the shroud, is just, it, it's debunked it, it's so poor, it's not good. A, a lot of people have that in their mind, because as you pointed out, uh, you know, it's not captivating the headlines because it's not sensationalistic uh, kind of material that captures the headlines of the day. And that truly is unfortunate. But the person that does truly dig and dig, when they find this information out, it truly is mind-blowing information. Yeah. So I think that's, for the people that are watching this, that's probably one point. Wow, I'm glad I saw that. And thanks to Michael Kowalski for giving us those those four slides. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, carbon dating is still used today, especially for articles that are well preserved in desert environments and things like that. So it, it's still a standard, but it, it, in as much as they try to clean the sample, there are still some contamination issues that can't be overcome sometimes. And so luckily we actually have some more modern methods. I know of at least four that have been used in the last 15 years on the shroud. And those are all more consistent with the first century, but that that's a whole nother talk in its own. So I won't to, uh, get into all the details of that. But we have other methods of dating things mm -hmm. besides carbon dating tests. That's just one of many. It's been around the longest, but yeah. there are others that you're going to see more in the future here. So well, anyway, okay. next, William, I wanted to show you that uh, in case people have a thirst for what was really going on, because I, I just told you about one protocol violation and there were 15 sure. of them. That can be found in this paper by Professor Emanuel Mella Marinelli. Oh, and wow. instead of having to write down that big website, you just go to shroud.com all right, and you do a search on Marinelli, and she had a paper in there in 2012. It's a 30 page paper. I've read it three times, very, very well done. 15 pages of it is footnotes. And she describes what was, what was said before, during, and after the shroud testing so they can get the details from that. And if they really want to get into this, Joseph Marino has put together an 800 page book. And there wow. you see it. And that is everything you wanted to know about the carbon dating and even more than you imagined, perhaps. All right. So uh, that takes a while to read, but it, it is very comprehensive. I don't know if anybody else has done a more thorough job of investigating that than, than Joseph Marino. So there's a couple of resources. Is, is uh, that book, is that book there available um, in a uh, ebook format or is it just a, a physical uh, edition? Yeah, I can't say that for sure. Okay. I, I, you might have to buy the, you know, the, the hard copy or the paperback, sure. maybe. Sure. sure. Which I, I'd be honest with you, I prefer that. Uh, but I know a lot of our, our current audience, uh, you know, sometimes they prefer having both, which there's really nothing wrong with that. But uh, you know what? As you continue your presentation, I'll look that up. But I'm pretty sure you could probably be able to find this uh, on Amazon, right? Okay, sure. Uh, can we go to uh, 
let's see. Let's go ahead and, and we're going to drop this one now. Let's see that right. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go this one. I think this is my last slide on this one here awesome. regarding awesome. questions, you know. So Peter and Peter and John, John tells us as an eyewitness account that, you know, that, that he goes to the tomb, the body was gone. And perhaps they, you know, they saw something like that. So, uh, you know, what, what was an, what was one of the questions that we're going to be answering is how, how might that have taken place? Okay. So we're, we're going to get into that, but I actually want to, we can edit this place part out here. Uh, uh, William, I wanted to get into, uh, one okay. more thing that significant deviation, what causes significant deviation. No worries. Whatever you want. Yeah. Let's just go back to a, yeah. Okay. Right. Perfect. And all right. Uh, let's see here. So there's at least four that have been proposed. All right. And uh, this is a, a table called the truth table where they look at what are possible ways that the image could have been formed. All right. Oh, okay. But why did the carbon dating show up as it did now? For your viewers, don't worry about reading all 170 of those boxes here. I just wanted to run this by you real quick. What, what caused the carbon dating of 1988 to be so you know, spread apart? Four ideas have been proposed. Uh, one was uh, in the 1990s, uh, Dr. Dmitry Kuznetsov of Russia did some experiments that saying, suggesting perhaps it was a fire of 1532. The difficulty in that one is we don't know how hot the fire was and how long it burned. So that, that's a questionable one. Another theory is by... Uh, Sue Benford and Joe Marino, who suggested that the corner of the shroud was a reweave, that it, it consisted of both 16th century and 1st century linen. And that was published in a paper by Ray Rogers in 2005. Uh, a third possibility, Dr. Robert Rucker of Washington State spoke about if the body went from, from matter to energy, perhaps there was a neutron flux that converted some of the carbon-12 into carbon-14. And then a fourth one proposed is by Dr. John Jackson, who led the strip team, that if carbon monoxide levels today are different than they were 2,000 years ago, then just a 2% difference could cause a shift of 14 centuries in aging the cloth. And so is it one of those? Is it a combination of those or none of those? I can't say, but those are four that have been proposed for what may have caused the carbon dating to go wrong, all right? And, and now the question that's addressing the slide that people see right now, you know, how was the image formed? Well, this too is an open question. There, there are three possibilities. Uh, over here at the top left where it says uh, the dead body only, was it a natural process? Does the body just do this? Well, down below there, there are features of the cloth and the shroud with X's. Those X's show that those hypotheses cannot explain those features, the superficiality, the 3D nature of it and those forth. So we have to eliminate those. And then in the middle at the top are the six artist theories that have been proposed. Some of these people have seen on TV before, and some of them might even look like, wow, that looks like it really could be the real thing. But when you, when you scrutinize these under the microscope, they fail to give the 3D image, you know, showing the light intensity. Uh, they fail to show up cloth to body distance correlation. Perhaps uh, there is a superficiality problem in the paints and pigments and dyes we're gonna soak all the way through. This is just two tenths of one micron across that outer most microscopic fiber all around the outside rim of it. So those have to be eliminated by the X's. But at the far right, where that red circle is at, radiation, you can call that a radiation event if you want or the, or the, the resurrection if you want. That is the only serious area being investigated today to answer that question of how the image was formed. So wow. And those three, radiation, they, they uh, revolve around three things. Uh, Dr. Jackson has proposed photons of light. Uh, Robert Rucker of Washington State has proposed a neutron flux. And Professor Julia Fonte has proposed a coronal discharge, electrons. So that's a very simplified version of it. All three of those gentlemen could give you a much more in-depth explanation. But if we're talking about radiation, was it protons, neutrons, or electrons? Those have been suggested. So we can't say with certainty, you know, which one of those is how the image was formed, right? Fantastic. That's a great chart, brother. That's a great chart. That's mind blowing. Wow. Thank you. Well, that comes from the book by Dr. Jackson and edited by Robert Seifer. It's called the, the Critical Summary with the Shroud. It came out about four years, seven years ago. A very, very comprehensive uh, uh, shroud book. OK, next question. Where do the, did the nails enter? I get that question all the time. Down toward the bottom center, you see the left wrist with that blood stain, right? The white blood stain. 
Yeah. And it's located in the wrist area. Now, this is where the exit of the of the nail would have been. This would have been against the cross. Mm -hmm. So the point of the nail is on the other side of my hand. And that blood stain you see in the picture matches up with that. Does that make sense? Uh, definitely. Okay. Without so a doubt. The back side of the hand shows it near the wrist. The entry point of the wound is something we're not certain with, all right? Because we can't see where it went in. There have been two proposed for this, all right? And here are those two. Pierre Barbet, Dr. Pierre Barbet, who wrote a doctor at Calvary back around 1950, proposed right in that wrist area called the Destot spot, about an inch and a half, two inches over toward the center. Dr. Frederick Zagabi, who I think just died in 2016, proposed, he was a forensic pathologist for a, a county in New York State. He proposed that it would be down here. Both of those are sufficient to, to support the body weight. This doesn't rip through. When Barbet did his experiment, he took an amputated arm I put an 80 pound weight on it and swung it back and forth for 10 minutes and it ripped through. So mm -hmm. you're not going to be supporting the nail up there. Yeah. But down here, when Zugabee uh, did his experiment, he was able to put gloves and bolts on living subjects and he could measure the pressure at that point. And it's 67 pounds of pressure if both feet are nailed. And we know the shroud, uh, the body in the shroud was nailed. So both of those uh, locations are sufficient to support that type of weight. Now, which one it was, I can't really say. And really, you know, does it really matter, right? But this yeah. is an open question. It's an open question, all right? Yeah, that's a great, great point. And oh. here is a life-sized artist sculpture of Christ based on the Shroud of Turin in Spain. We see permission to use this picture as well. And it, it shows the nail going through that desktop spot. Oh. Now, where did the nail go into the feet? People ask me, were there two nails at the feet or one? I get that question a lot. It appears to be only one, all right? And there you see a second type of crucifixion nail. The first type I didn't have time to show you, but we're going to enlarge this foot a little bit here. Down toward the bottom center, that right foot, you can see a bloody stain up around the heel, giving some off-image blood. And then below that is where the there is a tiny little kind of a diamond-shaped hole where the nail went through. There is a nail hole that is distinguishable on that right foot. So we believe there was probably just one nail that went through through both feet. Okay, how tall was Jesus? People ask that. Well, on the left, that is what the shroud looked like in 1978. On the right is the shroud in 2002. And what they had done was, you can see big differences. They took off the patches, they vacuumed it, and it stretched it out. All right. Oh, and, I a see. New and this was kind of done very covertly. The scientific world didn't find out about this until after the fact. It was very controversial. But in doing so, can you see it grow? Yeah. And oh, it, yeah. That can mean lengthen the shroud. And so it makes him appear to be a little bit taller. On the left, shroud, Jesus would have been maybe perhaps within five feet, 10 inches tall, give or take an inch. And on the right, he's over six feet tall. Uh, Jesus didn't grow, but the shroud did after that. Yeah restoration project so when people see different heights for jesus perhaps they're referring to what was his height before 2002 based on the shroud or what may it have been after 2002 and we have taken account other factors too and temperature of the room the the uh, atmosphere that the shroud is in in terms of that cloth stretching or, or not so that answers that question that is quite significant as well that yeah. there that was done there wow i was never aware of that yeah well, we're heading in the home stretch here. Uh, we can take the, the PowerPoint off now. Okay. Yeah. And just you and I, just you and I, and we're, we're done with the PowerPoints now. For sure. For sure. That, oh, uh, all of a sudden you got bigger. You got bigger. <laughs> I got bigger as well. Too. <laughs> that, that was truly mind blowing, brother. Wow. That was amazing. I, now, let me yeah, ask yeah, you this. One of the, I, one of the things to share with you, William. Yeah, yeah, definitely. People may hear about this soon. Uh, this last summer, uh, History Channel did a a documentary on the shroud called history's greatest mysteries wow and it was about the shroud of turn it featured six experts three of them are my friends but barry schwartz uh, dr cheryl white of lsu in shreveport louisiana and russ brialt who's been doing this for about 40 years all of wow. them very well versed in all things shroud and i'm glad that they had those three on the program i had a few others that i'm not fam as familiar with but for the sake of giving people a heads up on this I corresponded with a couple of them and asked them, okay, now that they showed this program here last week, what did you think of it, all right? And Barry said, well, they interviewed me for over an hour and a half, but of course they edited out, so only four minutes were shown. 
And those four minutes were not perhaps the better parts that he would have included. So he said, I'd, I'd give it a six or a seven, All right? Uh, Dr. White, she said, uh, you know, I'm happy that they invited our perspective to be represented because with so many of the theories out there floating around, at least we had a chance to, uh, you know, give our viewpoint. So she gave it a seven from that viewpoint. For me, it, it was a mixed bag. You know, it's 41 minutes long and there's 19 minutes of commercials. That's the, kind of the standard. You know, 50 yeah. years ago, television had about 80-20. No doubt. And now it's about two thirds show, one third commercial. So they're, they're, you're getting less content. A we lot did. of commercials, yeah. That's true, sure. yeah. And so um, for me, it, the mixed bag was they left out some factual information, you know, the more significant parts. For instance, the raw data from the carbon dating test of 1988, if they had shared with you just that fourth slide that I shared with you showing that it's invalid by the, by the, those the mathematical means, that would have been a real teachable moment, but I think it was yeah. a, a missed opportunity. And even if they had judged that to be too technical, they could have at least shared how it varies by 91 to 97 years every inch. And people can get that. Yeah, that probably is not true all the way across the shroud. And one of the yeah. could have avoided that if they had uh, stuck to the protocols and tested more than one area. But that's another story in itself. Right? But, yeah. Well, in, instead of sharing that factual information, it was left unsaid which allows some people to still put faith in, in the carbon dating test of 1988. So in that sense, it was an opportunity missed. Uh, I think all in all, it was a good thing they did share some information on the shroud, but that that's probably all we can expect from a, a secular source. You know, no let's doubt. not forget History Channel. This is the same channel that there is a significant block of their programming airtime devoted to ancient aliens. Yeah, that yeah. tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, that tells you everything you need to know. To me, I think that just the fact that you had a few top experts interviewed, given some time, the fact that they're even doing a show in the Shroud, uh, that's good in and of itself. But I'm not shocked that there is uh, not a whole lot of time devoted to that when, you know, they're going to saturate their channel with, uh, at times, what I think is mindless programming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot of other better things to do. It's, I think it's driven many of us back to books, which is a good thing. Very good thing. I mean, I, I really, by the way, I looked at book up and I was talking, you, you mentioned to the audience, it is only available in, in, in hardback. I recommend people get a hold of that, but it's a good thing. A lot of people get books, read them. I know a lot of people tell me I can't anymore, William. I'm too old. I need a, a electronic device to make the letters bigger, mm -hmm. the words bigger. No problem. No worries. The fact of the matter is it's important we get back to reading um, rather than sitting in front of the, uh, you know, that uh, the TV tube and just uh, losing a lot of time when you can be learning. And I think that sure. today's program really is going to drive people to wanting to learn more about the Shroud. And that's yeah. a very good thing. Thank you. And it's very timely in your part during the season of Lent to, you know, yes. suggest that to people. And I tell people when they when they get excited about this and they learn these things, uh, when you share the information, people with, with other people, it, it's not you don't have to, don't have to make it a debate. Yeah. You just share the facts and, and let the facts you know speak for themselves. And if the shroud is authentic, there's nothing I can say that's going to make it so. It already is. And, and likewise, if it's if it's not authentic, then there's nothing I can say to make it not authentic. You know that sure. the doubter, the doubters can't make it uh, unauthentic, and the believers can't make it authentic just by their own belief. You know it it is what it is. So so yep. don't be too concerned if if you feel like someone hasn't been convinced that that's not the point. Yeah, I think You're the right. point is. When we talked about you know the uh, the ancient aliens on History Channel, we all have that inner need, you know, the deepest longing of the human heart is to know God. And the fact that people are searching, they may not be going to church, but they're searching for Bigfoot. They're searching for the ancient yeah. aliens. They're they're looking for something that more that shows that that we all have been created with that that inner hard drive. Yeah. And if if they pursue these dead ends, that eventually they might turn around and come back and realize that, you know, uh, ancient aliens are not our salvation. Not at all. Politics is not our salvation, but, but Christ is our salvation. And, and that's something that's going to get you to eternity, eternal bliss with the Trinity, God willing. Amen, brother. What a fantastic message. What a fantastic presentation. Before we wrap up, I'd like to give you a chance as usual to let the audience know, are you traveling right now? Are you in the middle of traveling? And if the audience say, well, hey, you know what? I really enjoyed this program. I think uh, Jim did an amazing job, which I think you did. Uh, do you have a webpage? Do you have anywhere where oh. you can direct people towards? 
Brother, the floor is yours right now. Plug in anything you want to plug. Yes. Well, shame on me. I forgot to include my information card as one of those slides. You could have put it up. Say what? Well, well, I will send that. To I you. can add that. I can add that later. Yeah. yeah. It would be very easy to do. I, yeah. I don't have a web page. I, I don't have a budget. People invite me and I come and I've never made a dime doing this. I tend to stay with host families. So you yeah. don't need any ground transportation, no lodging, no meals. They just pay for the plane ticket, all right? Yep. And if usually when it's within 300 miles, I will drive, and there'll be a free will offering to, to, to cover the gas, that type of thing. So so money's not a, a big part of this. Uh, as far as getting a hold of me, I, I go where I'm invited, and it's been 23 states so far. Wow. And coming up, I'm going to do some new ones I haven't done before. doing Baltimore, Maryland in August. I'm going to be doing, oh, no, that's, that's going to be North Dakota. Yeah, wow. North Dakota, Baltimore, Maryland and uh ohio columbus ohio along with the other 23 states that puts it up to 26 now wow and people everywhere are interested in the shroud and i'm willing to come and give presentations i would encourage your viewers chances are some of them are movers and shakers and they're involved in planning conferences yeah and conventions and men's conference things that type of thing women's conference things even Eucharistic conventions, that type of thing. No I doubt. think this is very fitting for those. And I've, I've, I've been in a couple of those. I got to meet, you know, Scott Hahn, Kimberly Hahn, Dr. Edward Sri, those types Great of people. schools. We can reach thousands of people, uh, focus, that type of thing. So I'm, I'm open to doing those. But whether there's 30 or 3,000 or more or less, uh, I'll, I'll go where I'm invited if, if the time allows. And I typically do 35 to 45 talks a year. Wow. And I will give you that contact. Uh, basically, it's it's my phone number and email. Yeah. And I don't have a website. Uh, so I'm letting I'm letting God provide. Amen. Brother, you were fantastic today. By the time this does air, it'll be airing in the evening. As I told you, it'll be a Monday evening. I know the audience are going to be incredibly edified. And by the time it does air, I will have edited it in and put in your contact information there. So God willing, uh, actually, we know for a fact because God is amazing that the Lord will provide. And uh, without a doubt, we look forward to having you back on, brother. You are always welcome here in my channel. Thank you so much for your time, my friend. I thank greatly you. appreciated it. And thank you very much, William, for all you do in traveling around and spreading the good news. Uh, may, may we both continue to be blessed. Amen. And brother, I will be seeing you soon in, in Texas. I guarantee you okay. that. God love you. God bless you, brother. I'll talk to you soon. You take care, my friend. You too.